just want to just do first is just sort of warm us up a little bit. So we're going to play a C major scale, and um, we're going to just do it two octaves, and we just start off in the first position. So if you just go through this with me, very easy. You can use uh, whatever right hand fingering you want, but we'll all use the same left hand fingering. Okay, so let's try that again. I'm just going to do it's a nice slow beat. Okay, so um, just try and keep with the beat. Okay, I'll count out loud. Ready? One, two, three, four. C major arpeggio, okay? We'll use this fingering. We're going to go first position and then up to the fifth and back down again. Okay, so we'll just check the fingering first to make sure everyone's okay with that. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, to do now is I want you to turn to the person next to you, right, and I want you to play what we've just done to the person next to you. So choose a victim. All right, so obviously if it's people without guitars, they are willing participants in this. Uh, so everybody gets to do it just, just once, okay? So someone play, that, so it's going to be a little bit of a raucous, and, um, so you're just going to have to kind of project your energy towards the person that you're performing to. Okay, so I could have done this, I could have done this, I could have been really cruel at this point, and I said, okay, well, let's play into the group, you know. Well, I'm, I'm not going to ask that of you, but I just want you, you'll see the sense in this in a sec, well, I hope you will. Right, now. Okay, right, is everybody complete at the tap? Right, is everybody at the listener's satisfaction? Yeah. Yes. Is it good? Marks out of ten. Okay, um. So what I was trying to do then, it's kind of like a little, it's a little bit of sort of lab rap kind of thing in a way, but I was just trying to introduce sort of the feeling of actually performing, you know. Um, so obviously there's, 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 I'm sure there's people in the room with sort of different levels of experience with this type of thing. Um, but if I read out, so you don't have to put your hand up here, but uh, you can if you're, if you're in an honest mood. Um, if I read out a, a, a loop of uh, feelings that people commonly feel when they perform, and uh, you can either own up to them or you can quietly not own up to them, or you can maybe, I don't know, maybe you're a fearless person. So the first one is fear. Who's ever experienced fear before you perform? Okay? Alright? Um, physical tension or discomfort. Okay? Okay, we're, we're in, so this is getting a little bit like Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, imprecision, clumsy hands. Okay. <laughs> Negative self criticism. Okay. Disorientation or lack of focus. Not see the angle. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the focus group here. <laughs> um, the feeling that you have not lived up to your own expectations. Okay. The last one, you'd be relieved to know this is the last one. That you feel that you know what others are thinking about you. Okay. So, I mean, the thing is, is that obviously there are feelings that are common to everybody who performs, right? but some people find ways of dealing with those ways of performing. 
And uh, that's really what I want to talk about tonight. I did actually did a workshop a while back, uh, I think Yvonne came to it. And what I did, I think I, I, I distributed some of my notes, I kind of rewrote my notes, so you might have seen some of those notes um, about, um, about that. And I did quite a lot of detail in that, and that's obviously still there if anybody wants to have access to it. But I thought today that I'd just do something a little, a little bit more personal and try and kind of um, uh, talk about that, maybe a little bit more from my own experience and the own ways that I've actually um, sort of come to terms with this type of thing. So um, the first thing, this exercise that I gave you, there was a kind of a, a method to it. A, a while back I was working with a, with a, 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 a double bass player from the States, uh, Dave Leuven. Uh, and he'd come over that year and he'd been living in the States and performing in the States. And uh, when he was still at college, he uh, was taught, he was the luckiest guy in the world, he was taught by um, Ray Brown as a private student for a whole year. And um, I don't know whether you, you know, if you know anything about jazz, but if you sort of have the, t the handful of absolutely greatest bass players that have ever you know, walk the earth uh, in jazz terms. Ray Brown would absolutely be up there with him. If you want to see him, he uh, plays the Oscar Peterson trio, for example. And, uh, you know. and, um, and I noticed that uh, whenever we rehearsed or whenever we performed anywhere or anything, David would always get his double bass. And he would do just what I was doing just before. You know, he would actually do it slower than we were doing this as well, you know. you get on a metronome, and he'd put the metronome really, really slow, maybe about 40, around there, 40 or 50. And then he'd start playing a C major scale just in crotch shots, really, really, really slow. You know? <coughs> um, and then he'd play, um, he'd play a, an arpeggio, and, uh, and then he'd maybe move to G. And he'd just kind of get, get himself quietly in a corner and just spend five, ten minutes just playing away there, you know. And um, it really impressed me and it brought a lot of things to mind. And uh, it fitted in with a lot of things I've sort of discovered in my research since. For instance, I recently read a biography of um, Terega. Has anybody read this biography? No? Mm -hmm. Terega, um, in accounts of him performing, he would he would sort of pick up the guitar, you know, and he would he would do this type of thing. Choose a key and just improvise. Like that. And apparently, you do it for five, ten, fifteen minutes, you know, and he would, you know, he'd warm up, and then at some point, then you know. Start playing, doing his Terega thing. Um, it must be magnificent. But why was he doing that? Well, what he was doing is he was tuning himself into his instrument. You know, he was just sort of getting nice and comfortable and re relaxed, getting to the sound of the room, getting used to the sound of the room, getting used to the feel of the instruments in his hands, and getting himself acclimatized and tuned in. And um, and this is this is a really really you know this is a really kind of brave and good thing to do, but we don't always have the opportunity to do that. You know? um, if you're playing, you know, like a solo show or something like that, that can actually be a really really nice way to start. You know, I know Roland Dean's quite often starts with uh, improvisations when he you know did a thing to you know that's what he did. And so a, a lot of uh, a lot of musicians use that as a kind of a way into into playing. 
But it's assume that you've just got to sort of play just sort of off the cuff and you, you're playing a piece. How do you how to prepare yourself to do this? Well, um, I, the, the way that I thought to present this to you is just, just to think about sort of four areas. So the first area I'm thinking about is um, which is ourselves. You know, I'll detail this in a minute. The second area I want to just talk about is the, the you know, the uh, the instrument, relationship to the instrument. The third area is about the music itself, and the uh, the fourth area is about the people, right? Because I think these are kind of factors that um, it's it's a way of sort of thinking about it, which I think is is useful. So I think. The, 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 the most pernicious thing that sort of hits us as musicians is the sort of toxic effect of early conditioning and um, bad habits. Um, so when we learn to play, we pick up all sorts of ideas. You know, I mean, when we were in children in school, and this is a sort of a, an area that's so, so big uh, in the context of just sitting here for 40, 50 minutes and talking to you about it, we couldn't possibly hope to cover it. But all I can do is just sort of like maybe point in some directions and then in the hope that it will make you um, uh, think about it and research some of this yourself and I'll try and give you some sort of pointers um, about it. So conditioning, where do we start? Well, when we're in school maybe we have negative experiences or positive experiences and these shape the way that we feel. But what they do um, over a lifetime is that they affect us subconsciously. And then in times of stress or um, in times when we want to do well, these things have a way of sort of impinging themselves on our, on our, our conscious mind and they, 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 manifest, they manifest themselves as shyness or nervousness and all this type of thing. So the problem then becomes, well, how do, how do we start to deal with that? Um, well, when we, um, when we think, if we think about the way that the nervous system or the brain works, we've got two types, and I'm no sort of like brain expert, I've got to tell you this. But we've got two types of um, sort of brain function. We've got a thing called the sympathetic nervous system, which actually isn't very sympathetic at all. <coughs> so this regulates stress hormones. So stress hormones, uh, cortisol and adrenaline. And then we've got the parasympathetic nervous system, which, uh, which gives us this sense of well-being, uh, which um, produces in the body endorphins, um, serotonin, and um, dopamine. And um, the cortisone and the adrenaline are what cause problems in people when they become stressed, when they sit down to, um, when they sit down to perform. And those, uh, those, those hormones can absolutely wreak havoc with us as players. It's what causes shaking hands, it's what causes physical tension and that. And of course, the um, the endorphins, the serotonin, and the dopamine are really what we want to have flowing around the system when we're playing. So when we're playing and we're very, very relaxed and we're feeling happy and we're into the music, that's chemically, you know, that's what's happening in us. So when we're feeling tense and we're not really coping that well with the music, then it's you know what we've done is we've, we've got this other reaction to it. So. What we've got to do whenever we pick up the guitar, well, in fact, before we pick up the guitar, all right, is we've got to um, we've got to sort of enter into a, a sort of a mental habit. So what we do is we start to deliberately and consciously um, move into a, a comfortable state, all right, a musical state, you could call this. So, taking out a friend of mine, as is De Dejendi, who was uh, a, a mental health worker in Paris, 
he uses this term active presence, which I'm going to use. Uh, there's lots of other terms that we can use for this. You know, mindfulness is another one, but it's not quite what I mean when I say it, but it's enough. We know what we're driving at here. And uh, some of the terms that I like to use, and I'll use them in this conversation and be a little bit more descriptive as we go along. The other one is directed attention. So these are, these are things that we need to bring with us when we start practicing, right? Now, why do we need to do this? Well, because when we're practicing, we're doing exactly that. We're preparing ourselves to perform, right? So if we set good mental habits when we're practicing, then when we come to perform, then we've set up that, that virtuous condition and that with practice, and I was, I was, uh, I was talking uh, to this before with Yvonne on the way down, with practice and also with exposure. Because in the end, rather like me asking you to play your scales before when you, you, know, you play your guitar, you do actually need to actually go out and experience people you know, watching you. This is one of the things that a musician or a camera, you know, or a microphone um, or whatever. But it starts in the practice room and it starts when you're on your own. So what I'm going to do now, I'm, we're just going to try a little, um, a little experiment. I, I've actually been given a series of these uh, exercises and I do this quite regularly. The first time I encountered these was um, reading articles by Robert Fripp. Everybody know Robert Fripp? And he had a, 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 it was directly related to the guitar, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Robert Fripp, I'll show you what I do first, and I'll talk about what Robert Fripp um, was recommending, because his exercises are really, really good. In the ACs, he ran a series of courses called Guitar Craft Courses, and uh, he addressed a lot of these issues, and I think very, very effectively, you know. Um, but then I've heard them from a different direction, but, uh, but nevertheless, they're valid. So what I, I, I just do... Uh, I do, this, I do these types of exercises three times a day, right? I'm not saying that you should do this, right? But the reason I do them three times a day is because neurologically we know that the effects of them last between six and eight hours. So this is the way the brain functions. So you could, you could choose other um, similar exercises to these. In a way, it kind of doesn't matter, but these are very effective. Or well, the one I'm going to give you now is very effective. Six to eight hours, and it has that effect. But you need to do it every day, and you need to do this over weeks and months and years, right? And if you do so, what happens is you actually train your brain, or more precisely, you retrain your brain, okay? So this isn't some sort of magic thing, whereas I tell you to do this now, and then at the end of this 40 or 50 minutes, all of a sudden, that's it. You're never going to feel nervous again. You're never going to, you know, you're never going to get clumsy hands or make mistakes when you're performing, you know, or anything like that. People always make mistakes. I've seen John Williams make the worst mistakes imaginable when he's performing. If that makes anybody feel any better, yeah. My own personal hero, Ralph Towner. My God, <laughs> I've seen him play really, really bad ones. You know, like Leslie Gismonti, another hero of mine. Really, really bad mistakes. So, you know. Um, yeah. So let's get back to the exercise. So what I want you to do is just put your hands on your on your legs here. Stay nice and relaxed. Okay, now just kind of focus on what's upset for a moment. Okay? And uh, we just only take about, about two minutes, 60 seconds or so. So, the first thing is what I want you to do is just relax first. And the second thing I want you to do is just make contact with your body. So, just sense your body, sense the way your legs are feeling, your feet, knees. Torso, hands, your arms, your neck, your head. Just try and relax. Now, just in your own time, what I want you to do now is just become conscious of your breathing. Nothing special. Just focus your attention on your breathing for a moment. Now, what I want you to do is 
Just focus your attention on your right hand. So just feel the sensations in your right hand. Normally you're not aware of it. But now actually feel the sensations in your right hand. trousers against your hand or a sensation of your heart beating or the blood in your hand or the warmth. Now take your attention back to your head. Now the right hand again. observations about this. The first thing is, did you notice the way you didn't really want to leave that? So if you, were, if you get into it, it's such a pleasant sensation. It's not complex. Right? But what we've done now is we've actually changed the way that we're feeling and thinking. It's a very, very simple, very, very simple process. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's scientific. Right? But what we did then is we've directed our attention. Okay? And I make a joke about this, that one of the biggest problems I have when I get students is trying to convince them that they have the right hand. Okay? Because time after time when, when I'm teaching people, this is so much, this is so often the situation. Let's try and get this right. <laughs> I'm locked, I'm fixed on this here, I'm locked up here. Right. <coughs> left hand, left hand, where's my hand going? Here. It's like this hand doesn't exist at all, you know. So, what Robert Fripp suggested was this. He suggested that you just sit with the guitar like this, and then you sit in a playing position, and you do more or less what I've just said then. He just had it going between the left and the right hands. So here now, I focus on my right hand. Now, could you just grab your guitars and would you mind doing this? This might be a new experience for you. Okay, now just sit in your normal playing position. We'll come to playing positions in a moment, alright? So just grab your guitar. Now what I want you to do now, is just pretend you're going to play that C chord we were playing before. Alright, so here's the C chord. First position C chord, right? So now close your eyes. And let's just do Robert Fripp's exercise now. Let's just focus on that right hand. Okay. So when you become and what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna count us in. We're just gonna play that C chord. And let's just actually focus on the sensation of playing in the right hand. Count four in and we'll play that C chord. You ready? One, two, three, four. Okay, and then put the fingers back to stop the strings. And again, focus on that right hand. Okay, and just relax again. Right, for a lot of people, that's quite, that's quite a, a different thing, to focus <coughs> on the right hand like that. 
you know. And if you actually think about it when you're playing and you're practicing, your attention is quite often dissipated when you're practicing. All right? You're not really focusing on what your body is doing or focusing on precision in your hands at all. Right? You're just focusing, you may be thinking about what you're going to have for tea or what John Williams would think if he was listening to what you were playing. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, all sorts of things go through the mind, but quite often not on the physical sensation of playing. Right? But focusing on the physical sensation of playing is really, really important. You know? Getting yourself in tune with the instrument is really, really important. By the way, just I've mentioned John Williams twice now, so maybe I should say this as well. I read, um, I read a, a, a wonderful interview with Bella Fleck from Bella Fleck and the Flat Tones. Does anybody know Bella Fleck and the Flat Tones? No. Ah! Got you. <laughs> um, Bella Fleck and the Flat Tones are back. He's an amazing banjo player and he's really, really worth listening to. If you haven't listened to Bella Fleck, listen to Bella Fleck. And he, um, he made an album with John Williams playing Bark and stuff. Imagine Bark on a banjo with John Williams. But he, in the article, it was a great article, and he's a great, great musician. But um, um, he uh, talked about John Williams' recording process. I'll just share this with you, just to make you feel better, because this is a feel-good session. Apparently, John Williams, when he sits down to record a piece, he records the piece straight through, like that, you know? Right? And then he records it another five times, right? And then he records it in sections, and then the very, very difficult bit he records up to 20 times. <coughs> and then it. it's edited. Okay? So next time you listen to a perfect performance on a CD and you think to yourself, oh my God, that guy's good. He is. He really is. Because you can't make a sort of purse from a sound's ear, but, but, when you hear perfection, it's a kind of uh, it's a kind of an illusion. It's not actually true at all. And if you go and see the greatest musicians in concert, that's not to say every now and then you get a beam of light coming down and people play beautifully and perfectly. But it doesn't always happen, and so you mustn't have that expectation of yourself. Okay, so that's got John Williams out of the way. So we've talked about when we talk about active presence, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about being present in the music. So these kind of like focusing exercises that I've just given you, I actually use lots of them because what happens is if you try just one all the time, you kind of become used to it and blasé. So it's good to alternate them and do different ones. All right? So you kind of get a collection of them. All right? um, so focused attention is actually giving attention to your, your body, the precision of your movements and the music as well. Now this is a place that when you start performing you want to try and get into as quickly as possible. Because you know when it's going well. Hopefully you've all been there, you know. You're a little bit nervous when you first go on to play. You settle down. The audience fade. What happens? The audience fade into the background. All of a sudden it's just you and your guitar. The music's happening. You're beautifully in the zone. Even if you make a slip or you have a memory loss, you just play through it because the music's really happening. That's where you want to be. Right? So getting into that state, so that's what we call musically, that's a state of active presence. This is where we want to be as musicians. So now, um, I just want to just sort of expand this a little bit and just talk about the body, which is my next subject. So the first thing I want to do is just talk about posture. Um, so I was talking to one of my students this week about this very subject, and he's a really, really keen golfer. His golfing um, figures, I don't know anything about golf, cricket, yes, golf, no. But he's in the low single figures. Does anyone know about golf? No? no golf. I believe that's good, is it? Is that good? Yeah. Well, he's in the low single figures. He said to me, because we were talking about it, he said, the worst thing a person can do is try and imitate a professional golfer. And this is, he's taken all sorts, you know. So I said, oh, that's really interesting. So he rang a bell with me. You know, Why is that? So he said, because people have got to use, develop the technique and find their own way of expressing themselves in the movement. He said, you know, you can't imitate, you know, Tiger, so what's his name? Uh, you can't do that if you're a golfer because everybody's different physical shape, different physiology, different mind. You've got to find your own way of developing the technique in yourself. And this is also, this is so true of us as musicians as well, you know. 
I'm going to be like Segovia when I play the guitar. I sit like this, you know, this is Segovia, you know. I'm going to, I'm going to be like, uh, I, I'm, you know, I sometimes get people turning up, you know, they're, they're, guess who the big hero is, you know, it's like Keith Richards, you know. You know, that might make you sound like Keith Richards. But it's not going to make you sound like Segovia. It's all about body posture because the way that you play expresses the way that you, what your personality is like. It's a natural thing. It's you're communicating naturally when you sit down and play. So the first, the, the first thing is, 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 is what does posture do? Well, you see, if I'm physically tense in any way, what that's doing is that's affecting all of those negative feelings and hormones in my body. The second I introduce any physical tension, I should lift my shoulder up or something like this. Then all of that, what were they called again? Is anybody good at this stuff? All of the, um, I had to write this down, I actually did some research on this. Where are we? Um, ah, yeah, all of the cortisone and the adrenaline starts to seep into the system. Then you start to get physically tense and then it's downhill. From there, isn't it? So posture is just so important. Now, some of you might have noticed I sit with the guitar on my right knee. Okay, this is probably sacrilege. You know. <laughs> well, no, Arturo Dias didn't he? So, right so I'm in good company. Um, I actually sit like this. I used to sit with the guitar on my left knee uh, for decades, um, and it's not a position that I like or particularly approve of. Uh, here's a, here's a, uh, a hint. I read uh, a book by a guy called um, Ethan Kind, and it's called The Alexander Technique for Guitar. He was uh, trained at the Royal Academy of Music, and he's an Alexander therapist. I don't want to talk about Alexander. I've never done Alexander therapy. Uh, I've never been subjected to it or anything like that. But that book is marvellous. I really, really recommend that you read it. Uh, you, can get it you can get it on, um, on your Kindle. All right? And uh, he talks a great deal about posture because the whole thing about the Alexander Technique is the relationship between posture and feeling and the way that you're feeling, all right? Um, and he actually recommended, he recommended the guitar on the right knee. Now at the time we didn't have these rather wonderful things. These are just great, aren't they? You know, who would, who would swap one of these? Oh, there's some footstools. I was going to say, they're like, <laughs> would, you give, would, would, I, would I swap one of these for two footstools? No, you know, not even ten footstools, you know. The footstool, it raises your foot, your, your hips twisted, twists your back, you know. There's all sorts of postures. Footstool's a really, really bad thing. Now, I know you're used to it, I know you've been playing with it for years, uh, but these are much better than footstools. Um, but he recommended this going on the right leg, and he actually said that, he actually suggested carving a piece of wood to change the shape of the bottom, so it effectively does what that does, but this is a much better invention here. Um, that puts it right where it wanted. Just very, I don't want to get into this too much, we could talk about this at length. The reason I like this posture more than the standard classical posture is because of the position of my arms, just very briefly. Uh, and uh, he makes this point, the Alexander therapist, because you see, if I take the guitar away, my arms are like that, okay? This is a natural position for the arms to be in, okay? This is just coming straight out from here and relax, the space underneath my armpits, I'm nice and relaxed. Okay, this hand is here where it needs to be. Uh, with this wonderful thing, bringing this up into the right position here, I've got no problem. <laughs> got no problem accessing the higher frets, okay? Um, my left hand is exactly where it needs to be, look, it's just nice, see? Low fret, high frets, okay? Now, if I put the guitar here, now look where my right arm is, and look where my left arm is. Now I'm going to take the guitar away, 
Okay? Now seriously, who sits like that? Right? But this is what happens every time you sit in the standard. Firstly, you must have noticed the tendency to twist to the left. Okay? It gives people bad backs. Particularly if you do that with footstool. Now you're really in trouble. Look at this. You know? I watched um, I watched Julian Breer giving that master class to those three it's on it's been on BBC TV. I couldn't believe I was looking at it, you know. I mean Julian Breen was bad enough, I'm sorry Julian. <laughs> but um, there's the students that he was teaching. Oh god. Like this. It twisted and it just looked awful. It looked awful, you know. If you're gonna model yourself at anybody sitting with a footstool with a guitar on the left knee, John Williams, you know, it's fantastic. But well, some of the younger generation of classical players now have been really, really well taught. They know how to relax with it, it looks good. I'd still, you know, for me personally, I still want my arms here, which is where I have them, not there. Okay, well, you can experiment with that. But my broader point is this, if you feel comfortable with that, great. I mean, if you feel comfortable with it, that's fine. I'm not saying don't do it. And my own students, I, I'm teaching them classical guitar. I always teach them in an orthodox position. And then I sort of like, talk about that position and you know and, and give people the option to, to think of either way, to, to put it either way. But the point is is that whichever position is, if you become mindful, if you pay attention to the way you're feeling, then you can start to detect if there are any areas of tension in your body when you're playing. Okay? So just going back to that exercise before, next time you start playing, practicing, sit down and just sort of Oh, whoa, what am I doing here? Or I'm tense here, or I'm tense here, I'm squeezing the, my toes, something like this. Try and become conscious of those things and ask yourself why, and then don't do it. Stop yourself doing it. And every time you do it, you pay attention, you stop. And you develop the habit of checking your body and recognizing, feeling that physical tension. If you develop that habit over weeks and months, years, what happens is gradually you learn to recognize it as it's happening and it never gets hold of you in quite the same way right dealing with tension it's a long-term project yeah. okay so breath tension warm-up well i think warm-ups are really important so uh, going back to dave Levin again um, he was warming up by playing the scales he's not just warming up physically but he's warming up his ear and he's warming up his brain as well so sitting down, playing scales, but when you play the scales, don't play them fast. Play them really, really slowly. Really, really slowly. Because you're not there to... You can wait until that, you know, the, the flashy bit when you play that. When you're playing the scales, you're tuning yourself into the instrument, you're getting comfortable with it, you're tuning your ear, so play slowly. Right, now, the next thing, uh, talking about here is, is, is just the mind so the next thing is the thing that I call the singing mind um, this is a phrase I use for myself all right this is not a phrase I think that you should go and use you know this is like a personal thing so what do, do what do we mean by the singing mind well you see this has got to do with memorization and not forgetting things all right you see if I'm playing a piece then I can, in my mind, play every single bit of that piece. Okay, and I'll to do this a little bit more detail in a moment, but it's because I really, really like the piece. Do you see what I mean? It's because I feel that it's a piece that I want to play. So if I sit here now and I think of, of a piece, as I'm playing it, I'm actually singing the thing to myself as I'm playing it. Now this has some real, real benefits, okay? The first thing is, is that when you do this, you don't speed up, okay? You don't speed up. Well, I'm talking to you now, aren't I, you know? I'm not getting faster and faster as I talk, you know? But this is what we often do as players, you know, don't speed up. So, I don't know, does anybody watch the Alan Neely stuff on YouTube? Okay, so this is my next heads up. Watch Alan Neely on YouTube. He went to um, Berkeley, and then he went to Juilliard, right? And now he's like a New York musician, and he does these fantastic pieces. There's one, 
uh, which is called How to Improve Your Time, and he, he quotes a lot of research on it. Apparently dolphins and parakeets, um, you've seen this haven't you? <laughs> dolphins and parakeets actually keep time brilliantly. And there's actually a film on YouTube, you don't believe me. There's a film on YouTube of this parakeet grooving and counting, and it really just does, it really, really keeps the groove. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson, eat your heart out, it's probably. <laughs> But the, 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 the real serious point to this is that, you see, the reason dolphins do this as well, the reason is that animals that vocalise, which includes us, right, there's this relationship between vocalising and rhythm, which is why, which is why when you're practising, when you're learning a piece, you should count out loud. Play it slow and count out loud, right? Because by vocalising it, what you're doing is you're sort of like linking with this, this, this deeply ingrained evolutionary, physiological, um, um, uh, uh, aspect of what it is to be actually human, which is probably one of the reasons why music um, strikes us so deeply, okay? So, to, to get back to singing, so as I'm, as I'm playing a piece, I'm singing it, I'm not going to lose my place, I tend not to speed up, in fact when I've recorded, you know, um, oh, well, my album is on sale. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if anybody wants to buy one of the CDs, uh, you know, come and see me afterwards. Yeah. And my book as well. I've done a book on improvisation, which some people might have seen, some people not. Um, that's a plug. What was I saying? Yeah, when I was recording, I was really, really interesting because uh, that album was the first solo. Because previously, when I've recorded, I've recorded on ensembles and what have you. That's the first serious attempt at a solo album. And when I did different takes, I was interested, so I, I took the metronome, you know, and I just sort of click tracked it to see. And my timing was dead on on all three. I was using the same pulse each time. I mean, you know, really, absolutely dead on. Which were, I, nobody was more surprised than me when I when I found that. It made it really easy if I was dropping um, mangled parts in, if I was doing any editing, because it just absolutely snapped in there. You know, I didn't plan it like that. It's just the way. I so, um, so this singing thing, it, it, it also it stops you, you, you uh, memory loss because what's happening is that you're not thinking, oh, am I going to make that C? You know, on the eighth fret, you know, am I going to make that? No, you're just thinking about the thing, and you're in that lovely state when you're just playing and relaxing. You know, the music's happening. You're not thinking too much about the audience, and you're performing it. So this singing, this singing when you're playing, is is just so important. But you won't do it straight away. It's something you have to get into the habit of doing, right? Now, if you if you're playing a piece and you can't sing it and you can't visualise it all the way through, right? Don't try and perform it. You really, really don't try and do it because you just you're asking for problems. So if you think of your favourite classical guitar piece, you know most of your classical guitarists here, you sing it all the way through. If you play that piece, if you play that piece, can you kind of, as you're closing your eyes, can you imagine yourself playing it? Not in massive detail, but making all the big moves and reaching, and now I'm going down here, and now I'm going up here. And Can you imagine yourself doing that? This is a really, really helpful thing, you know, when, you, when you're playing. Okay, right, now. So, uh, where are we? The music, yeah, we've been touching on the music. Oh, yeah, sorry, uh, just a few things. Fear sitting positions, Ethan Kind. Uh, relationship with the guitar, feeling comfortable, not fearful. Quite often you're fearful when you pick up the guitar. Uh, this, is something that, this is something else that you need to think about. You know, the guitar seems to be scared of, it, you know. What you have to do is you have to really, really, this thing has to become your friend. You have to really, really like your guitar. I know it's a bit, you know, I love my guitar, you know. <laughs> but I kind of do, you know, I love the grain on the wood, you know. There's all sorts of things about this to be really, really nice and grateful about. I love the fact that this neck is hand-carved. I often think about the guy that carved this and how comfortable he wanted my hands to feel. Why? Right, because gratitude kicks off all these endorphins. You start feeling grateful for things, you start feeling good. I think, my, what a beautiful guitar this is, you know. 
and then that makes me feel good about it, you know, these little kind of tricks, you know. So, so I feel comfortable with the instruments. Tommy Emmanuel, there's a name to conjure with. When he gets a new guitar, the first thing he does is he gets a screwdriver and he goes, and he batters it. You know, it was all scrapes and everything all over it. Now, <laughs> don't ask me to do that. <laughs> but, I mean, I know why he's doing that. I mean, I really do. Does, I think, does everyone in the room know why he's doing that? Any suggestions? <clears throat> Just so he won't get too precious about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Takes the mystique of it. Exactly. He feels comfortable when you give it a bit bass and he picks it up and it's, it's this. It's a scratch, you know. You feel good about your dings. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't got any dings. This is a quite new guitar, this one. So it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, so, but why? Because I feel comfortable. So now I feel physically comfortable. I feel mentally comfortable. I feel good with my guitar. You see? So now it becomes something... It's something I can start talking through to people. You know, it's something I can start communicating with. Right, so. Okay. So, just to, just to, again, this is a huge subject. Maybe down the pub, this one, right? Choice of woods. What do you want your guitar to sound like? Do you want a cedar top? Do you want a spruce top? What do you feel about rosewood? How do you feel about, you know, uh, walnut or maple? Um, scale length, you know, string tension, you know, do you want a long scale length? I'm one of those big Ramirez's, or one of my students has got uh, 663 scale length. Every time he gives it to me, I tune it up and I try and play it, and then I give it him back. <laughs> it was made by, handmade by Polo Burnaby. I can't play the bloody thing. <laughs> it's, it's a terrible shame, you know. But I, I like 650 or shorter. So this is uh, 643, six, this. It's short, but the, the strings are really soft. It's like, like, like playing a classical guitar. Okay, which is kind of nice because I play, obviously, play nylon string guitar as well as steel string. And this is nice because these strings are just, just nice for me. Same width as a classical guitar here, a little bit narrower here, but this is 60 mil. I've got a, I've got a Ramirez and it's the same width of the body as, the, as this steel string. So this is easy for me to put this down and pick up the classical. Um, small body guitar for me, you know, I would dread it when people walk in with dreadnoughts or, you know, big body guitars. I just, you know, it's bluegrass standing up, yeah, you know, going about. Well, it's got a small body guitar I'm assisting with for sure. Um, okay, pickups and amplification. Right, I'm a great believer in pickups and amplification. I know that you get some classical purists. I know that um, Julian Bream didn't. I know that Segovia definitely didn't. <laughs> I know that John Williams does. I know that loads and loads of players do. My own feeling, well, I'm deaf. And so if I'm like three, three rows back, forget it. You know, I'm just... You know, I can't hear it anyway, which is a terrible shame. I, I watched, saw John Williams at the Phil year, he saw Segovia years before that. I couldn't hear a thing. You know, <laughs> it was terrible. Would have been great. Just stick a nice, just stick it, just stick a nice condenser microphone, just about there. Nice quality preamp. Stick it out with a Bose PA or something like that. Beautiful. It doesn't even need to be loud. You know, in fact, what I try and do is playing in a smaller place. I try and get most of the acoustic sound of the instrument coming, whoa, coming through, plus a little bit of reinforcement through the amplification. If I'm playing a bigger venue, then it has to be all amplification because I want people to hear. You know, it's as simple as that. So it, it's just so kind of okay. I, you know, I've got strong feelings. It's just so good. I, you know, just to think, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, because I'm going to be pure. You know. In a nice room like, well, that's a very nice room, but in a room like this, you know, obviously you don't need it, but uh, lots of other places, you really, really do need amplification. Particularly these days, there's no excuse, because amplification has just become fantastic the last sort of 20 years or so, you know. Um, am I okay for time here? Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How long have I been going for? 45 minutes. Okay, right, all right. Feels like about 10.
Go on. <laughs> I'll get there. I'll get there. We're moving on. Okay. Um, so pick up some amplification. So again, if anybody wants to argue with me over this, if anybody wants to take it up with me, have it out with me in the car park. Surely got to be horses for courses, you know, it's as it's appropriate. It is, yeah, it is, but I, I've been to too many classical guitar, you know, sorry, I'm going to be, I've been to too many classical guitar concerts and as a person with a hearing disability who struggled, you know, the best will in the world have struggled and people of all ages and people have hearing disabilities, uh, people get cheap seats and they struggle, you know, but if you, I, I, I um, I played through used Bose PA systems. You know the line arrays. You don't need monitors in them. I don't. Have you used these, anybody? Beautiful. They're like a big column, right? I played. Um, I played at St Anne's Church in the centre of um, Manchester. So there's two levels. There's like a balcony level, and then there's a level that is about 500 people. And when we did the sound check, I just had a microphone on the guitar. No monitor, because it throws the sound out at uh, 180 degrees. And then, the audience are hearing the same level of sound as I'm hearing. It's just beautiful. Pat Metheny's using them now, you know? And you're playing, and it's a comfortable volume level, and then you walk right to the back of the place, and you can hear it clear as a bell. And you can hear all the frequencies, nice low frequencies, mid-range, upper range. Absolutely beautiful. And there's loads of these now, these, you know? and beautiful microphones and lovely, lovely preamps, you know, and you can, you can get a gorgeous sound acoustically, you know, if you're going to, if you start dealing, if you start playing, you know, with, um, if you start playing with percussionists, double bass players, percussionists, drummers, electric guitar players, I've played a lot of jazz and, uh, you know, uh, various forms of, various forms of jazz, um, then you need an internal pickup because you're going to get problems with feedback. Um, I've got a K and K Pure Mini in here. Previously, I had an LR Banks, uh, which was great, but it, it it started to fail on me, and the second it started to fail, out it came. You know, but this K and K is beautiful. It's really really good. If I back that up with a microphone, it can sound really beautiful. So I'm a great believer in amplification for classical guitar, unless you're in a small space. Okay. Um, right, the music. Now, uh, just to talk briefly about this motivation for playing the music. I did touch on this before. Maybe she should throw this back at you. Can, you. can somebody name a piece they're presently playing? Anybody? Legrima. Sorry? Legrima. Legrima. Right. You're, you're playing that piece because you really, really like it. Yeah. Right, okay. And this is a piece you've heard other people play, and it's a, it's a piece that you want to you want to kind of convey some of that magic. That's because it, it's a very beautiful piece, isn't it? I think it's a very beautiful piece. So that's that's some that's something that, that that's your motivation for playing it, you know? Because you see, as a teacher, I constantly come up with people who have all sorts of really really bad motivations for playing pieces. All right. So the worst motivation that you can have for playing a piece is, I want to play this because I saw, you know, I'm saying this, I'm actually learning a piece, this is my bad, yeah, I saw Ed Berzo Guzmanti play this piece, so I'm going to play that piece, you know, I want, to, I want to play that like him, you know. That's really, really bad reason, you know, because I'm going to play that because it's a virtuoso piece, I want to, I want to be a player, I want to be a hot shot. That's really, really bad. Or you're playing it because you want to impress people. You want people to think, oh yeah, you know, I'm a bit, I'm a bit good, you know. So I can play, I, I can play the Shokan, you know, or I can play the Nocturne. By the so your first motivation must be because you love it. Why? Well, because if you don't love it, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to sing this internally, are you? You're not gonna be able to really, really. Play that piece in a sincere way. Do you know what I'm driving at here? It's going to be insincere. You're going to learn all your chops and then you're going to be worried about whether you're going to be getting up to here and I'm not playing it up to speed. And I'm not 
off and you know it's just not good but if you're playing the thing sincerely and because you're finding it very very beautiful to play that's a totally different mindset now i improvise you know a lot in my pieces so my pieces well, some, you know, it just depends. Sometimes I improvise, just improvise spontaneously, you know, and sometimes, uh, most of the time, my piece is, is complex. Most of the time, there's compositional elements in my pieces, but I vary them. So, in a sense, I'm always improvising. In other sense, I'm using structures, but there's bits in the pieces where I'm improvising, but, but I improvise a lot anyway. And that's a really nice place to be in, because because I can respond to the way that I'm feeling. So I don't have to be a virtuoso when I'm improvising. But when I'm, when, if it's going well and I'm feeling good, then I can be a virtuoso. That's a big advantage of improvising. It's, this is a nice thing. I don't have to turn it on here at this point because that's what the score is telling me to do. You know, this is, this is a good thing. So motivation for playing pieces. So that's, uh, that, that's something to think about because people choose all the wrong reasons for playing a piece. Right, now the next one I just want to just touch briefly on um, is tempo. So, tempo when you're slowing, when you're practicing, sorry. When you're practicing, slow. Now when I say slow, right, I mean really, really slow, okay? Now I mean so slow that when I practice, I bet that I practice slower than anybody, well, I don't know actually, I don't know you, you know, but I bet, but I practice as slow as anybody else in this room, <laughs> at least as slow. Um, so for instance, my idea of slow in a complex piece is semi-quavers at 40 beats per minute, because that's as low as my metronome will go. Right, Frank will back me up here, won't you, Frank? Yeah? yeah. Semi-quavers are 40. That's not crotchets at 40, semi-quavers at 40. That's slow. Okay? This is hugely powerful thing when you're learning. Because even though it's so slow, everything's in place at the right time. Once everything's in place at the right time, then you can speed it up. Speeding it up is the easy bit. Getting the shape of it in the fingers is the hard bit. So you go as slow, so you're playing it absolutely perfect. You know, I often joke, you know, even if you played, you can play the most difficult piece in the world if you played one note an hour. That's slow. Think about it, right? It's still correct, isn't it? You know, one quaver per hour? It'd take you about a year to play, if you think. <laughs> but it would be correct. You know, you know, yeah. <laughs> Well, surely uh, enough would have died by the time you played it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, completely correct. Good, good point. <laughs> Maybe I'm over egging the cake here a little bit, but you get what I mean. It'd take you four hours to play a minimum, then, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I'm, I'm, but I'm actually being serious. No, slow down. Semi quavers at 40, semi quavers at 60. Good speed to practice. When it's all in shape, when you're nice and relaxed, when you've got all that serotonin and endomo and whatever going around in your system, then you're setting up that virtuous state of mind, then you speed up and it's still there. Okay? That's what you take with you when you perform. Okay? You, what you don't do is you say, right, I hope we play this the other night, okay, 60 beats, some, you know, crotchets at 60. Damn! Oh, damn! No, I'll try it again, okay, damn, like that. And then you get on stage and that's how you end up playing. You know, it's, that's not the way to do it. Start slow, stay relaxed. The second, this is, this is going back to, um, to being uh, mindful uh, again. You see, when I'm, when I'm practicing, I've been practicing this week quite a lot. When I'm playing the piece, I know my piece is well enough, so I'm not having to think where my fingers are going. Okay. And I'm sort of singing away, I'm getting into them. But what I'm watching is my body. I'm watching my body right mad. And what I, what I might find is that there's certain parts of my body that begin to kind of like tense up a little bit. I'm not going to say it's quite intimate. Right? But I feel that little bit of tension happen. That's like a red light. It's like in one of those movies when the dial goes into the red zone and the red light starts flashing. Whoa, what's that? That's tension. I stop. 
slow it down, and get a metronome out and go over it like that. Then, and I'm playing that without any physical tension, and I play the piece, and I'm watching again, and I watch. So when I get to that little bit in the piece, if I'm getting that tense feeling again, that's my body, that is my other self, my wiser self communicating with me. That's saying, Paul, that's the bit you're going to hook up on. <laughs> Sunday evening, that's the bit that's going to get you. It will, for sure, yeah. you know. So what, you, what you're doing is your body is actually telling you something. Now, if you don't pay attention to your body when you're practicing, you'll pay a price. Right? This takes me back to the Robert Fripp exercise that we did earlier. Pay attention to the body and the way that you're feeling when you're playing. All right? I said this would be personal, didn't I? <laughs> okay. Next thing. Sorry I'm referring to my notes there. This is uh, very unprofessional of me. Okay, yeah, the advantages of singer-songwriters. Singer-songwriters. When a singer-songwriter is doing something, I mean, okay, we could be flippant about this and say, okay, you know, you know how it goes. Who needs another soulful rock ballad? <laughs> I'm going to tell you how I broke up with my last girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, who wants to know? <laughs> no, I'm very you know. uh, I do like instrumental music though, because it doesn't shout at you. But um, what's the advantage of that? Well, the first thing is singing. So, what's he doing? Anyone? He's posting himself, isn't he? Yeah, he's vocalising, isn't he? Yeah, he's not going to speed up. This is great. How many singer songwriters, you know, do you see doing the, telling you about their latest, you know, relationship crisis? How many of them do you see speeding up when they're singing? None. Okay. Second thing is, is that even though it doesn't mean much to you, they mean it. Right? You know, now I, I've got to be careful because I've got a camera on me now. I usually embarrass myself in lessons. Because I, what I do is I like to improvise sing the song, write the song. So it becomes a little theory lesson. So what I do is I say, okay, to a student, choose a key. I'm tempted to do it for you, but I've really got to control myself here. Choose a key. So if someone says, I don't know, G. You say, okay, so name four numbers, one to seven. So they go, you know, four, six, one, three. So I say, okay, so that's a, that's a C, that's an E minor. I forgot what I said. That's a G and that's a B minor, all right? Okay, so then play the chords, put it in 4-4 four, four time, give it an appropriate rhythm. Name a subject, gardening, you know. And then I kind of improvise a song on the spot, you know, to do this with. Um, and what I do is I sort of put all the emotion in, in my voice. I kind of want to demonstrate it to you, but I, I'll hold back. So it's like, uh, oh, my Lord, my, you know, I'm like this, you know. Now, when you do that, when you affect that emotion, like they do in adverts, you know, the Citroen 3.3, <laughs> and the voice breaks at the 3.3, what the hell's going on there, you know? But when you, when you trick yourself emotionally to kind of doing that, <laughs> um, what, what happens is you're, you're signalling to your body and yourself a particular way to perform. But when we're playing instrumental music, can you see the disadvantage that we're at in comparison to singer-songwriters? Okay. So they, re hey, they really mean it. They do really mean it. It's about them. They wrote it. You're going to listen. Um, and, and they can keep in time. You know? So, so that, that, that's a sort of huge advantage, just going back to what we're saying. Uh, okay, so... Um, uh, so where are we now? Yeah, so okay. Now also uh, choosing a time for an eventual time for a piece, right? There's no such thing as a correct time for a piece. Julian Bream on the road says he plays the piece different every time. Every evening he plays, he plays it different, and he plays it interestingly. Changes the dynamics around. So hopefully there's no you haven't got sort of like some sort of um, some sort of uh, some person checking the score. Oh, he should have done a diminuendo there, and he did a crescendo. You know, a student of mine was watching Zufei Young play the uh, the Rodrigo guitar concerto, the big one, and uh, people sat next to her, and there's a woman and her daughter, and right in the middle of that, I mean, the courage it takes to play that concerto with a big orchestra. For heaven's sake, give the girl a break! And she, and this woman sat there, and right in the middle of it, you know, probably one of those ridiculous bits. 
She turns to the doors of Triumph, and this is my student telling me, and she goes, she made a mistake there. Like <laughs> 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 <You know? laughs> What can you say about that? You know, for heaven's sake. Um, so, sorry, I've got off my subject again. Um, so, yeah, Julian Bream so changes dynamics all around. Why? He wants to keep it fresh. He wants to play expressively. You know, he wants to be in the moment. He's taking an improvisational approach. So the score, take the score with a pinch of salt, unless you're doing an exam. Then if you're doing an exam, sorry, you've got to do it properly. Choice of tempo. Now, the best quote that I've heard for this is from Daniel Barenboim, who wrote um, a book which I've forgotten the name of, but it's by Daniel Barenboim. And he gives you this analogy, and I'll hold this in your mind because I found this really, really useful. He says, Tempo is like a suitcase, packing a suitcase, right? So you've got your clothes, that's your piece of music, right? Now, if the piece is going to be played very, very fast, it's smaller, it's short, it's like a small suitcase. Now, if you've got a lot of content, if you've got a lot of clothes, if you try and cram them into that small suitcase, when you take them out, they're all going to be creased, yeah? Or you won't be able to get the auto burst open right in the middle of uh, customs. <laughs> it's going to be a mess, okay? So, the amount of content in the piece dictates the tempo. This makes sense, doesn't it? So if you're playing a really up-tempo piece, you can't fit all those crescendos and diminuendos. And why? Because you're going hell for leather, you know, you've just got to keep it going. If there's a lot of content, if there's a lot of articulation, staccato or legato, then you've got to accommodate that in the tempo and within your own abilities as a player as well. If the content is slight and the tempo is too slow, then you're going to send everybody to sleep. The, the, the clothes will come out creased because they're just rattling around. You see the analogy I'm trying to make, if you've got a big suitcase, and that, you know, then it's not going to, that's not going to be a happy result because you, you, know, you haven't got enough to fill the tempo then. So this becomes a critical decision. You, you judge the tempo by the amount of content in the piece. Okay? So, I, mean, I, you know, I hope this is meaningful for people, you know, this sort of making sense. So that's Daniel Barenboim, so it should be, shouldn't it? So, uh, and also, I'd also suggest uh, that you watch Wim Winters' Authentic Sound on YouTube. Wim Winters, okay? He's got this fantastic thing. He's a pianist who plays harpsichords and all sorts of period instruments. And he's done a series of fantastic um, uh, programs on um, tempo in 19th century music, um, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, you know, 18th, 19th century music. Um, because there's this huge thing, because we, just, just very, very briefly, to keep your mind on the watch now, just, just very, very briefly, um, well, a lot of 19th century music has ridiculous tempos and he demonstrates this beautifully you see because he'll take a piece of you know Mozart or something and, and you know this is the edition you know and it's got 126 beats per minute and he can't play it he's a really accomplished player you know he can't play it 100 and no, nobody else can play it so 126 so how do they explain the tempo marking you see they say oh well you see now this is um, this is the, well this is actually an excuse right because the players in those days were so good and now players these days can't match you. This is, this is, no, this is serious. This is what's been, you know, music schools. This is what they tell you, you know. Um, or, or the other one, this is a good one. It's an aspiration. It sounds a bit like a Tory politician. <laughs> it's an aspiration. So, so, they, these are all excuses. The truth of it, the truth of it is that they actually it, measure tempos. They might have got smaller fingers and the fingers oh, could be faster. That's yeah. it. Because the, the, the diminutive mm -hmm. that, That's good. <laughs> that's good. Oh, yeah. Of course I'm not. There there is, is, only about that big. <laughs> get around quicker. Excellent. You should, you should suggest that. You know. yeah. uh, they, they did actually have mechanical uh, instruments, you know, with rolls and things that they were developing in the 19th century. So they actually had some of these speeds, and they've actually used some of these piano rolls type things to justify these speeds. And no one else can play on your piano roll can do it. Uh, the truth of the matter is, and if you watch his thing, he makes very convincing arguments. What they, what they perceived was that uh, the beast was like a baton. 
And so there was enough and a down movement in it. So that the, the metronome is actually marking quavers and it's the upstroke, which is the, the beat. So it's in the movement. So it's two clicks on the metronome to one beat. And he demonstrates it beautifully because he, he firstly, he shows this on the computer, speeding it up to the suggested tempo in Beethoven's own hand. So it must be right. And it's just funny to watch. It's really, really funny to watch. And then he plays it at this tempo as he's interpreting it. And he quotes all sorts of scholarly quotes from the 19th century to justify it. It sounds beautiful. It's not too fast. It's not rushed. All the, all the uh, articulations there, all of the, um, uh, all of the uh, ornamentation is beautifully articulate. It's great. You think, ah, it's, it's Mozart the way it should be. Um, so that's the thing about tempo. So just some thoughts about tempo for you. So don't take scores literally. Don't, don't be bound by musical scores. Um, okay, moving swiftly on, other people. Right, question, can you read other people's minds? Right, so the guy, two rows down, sitting there looking grumpy and annoyed. It depends he, on whether you're married to them or not. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to steer clear of that one, actually. <laughs> I tried to steer clear of politics. Just Almost before. he's got a pathway to my brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the, the thing is, right, is the guy down the second row there is looking a bit groovy. He, he might just need to get to the, to the gents, <laughs> you know. <laughs> or he might have just had a row with his, mm -hmm. his partner, you know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But it's very, very easy as a performer to think that we can read other people's minds. And it can be really, really off-putting. So don't do it. Um, now, this, this is one of these huge subjects. There's a book by, this is another heads up, I hope you're taking notes here. This is, this is a book by Edward T. Hall, who's a psychologist and anthropologist in the States. He's written a book called The Dance of Life. Right? This is a marvellous, marvellous book. I got it because Doris Lessing referred to it in one of her novels. And I read it because she'd sort of like referenced it so heavily. And it really, really is worth reading for any musician. Now, again, this is probably a several hour conversation and I can't really do it justice, but just to say that through extensive research and study of human beings, um, using brain waves, eye movements, everything, what it comes down to is that if you're sitting playing a piece of music or if people are listening to a piece of music, what happens is the brain waves, the breathing and the heartbeat all synchronise and coordinate. This is a very, very magical thing that happens when we're playing music with people, particularly singing in choirs, but it also happens when you, you know, you know, just very, very briefly, one of the experiments we did, which I thought was stunning, right, so I'll just share this with you, right, they were filming a, a group of school children in a playground with cameras, you know, from up on high, and um, because what they were looking for by speeding up and slowing, a friend of mine who's a barrister who trains people, um, actually uses this technique, having read the book, to train barristers, because what are they doing when they're speaking to the judge? They have these little movements, and when you speed the film up, it, it shows these movements that aren't seen at normal speed. And so when they speed the film up, they realise that people, this is what's called the dance of life, people are actually dancing unconsciously. So the dance might look like this. <laughs> like this, literally, you know, and they all have a good laugh, you know. So anyway, so they're filming these children in the playground, and they realise that when they speed it up, that the whole pl playground is grooving to this particular beat. You know, you've got 20, 30 kids in the playground, right? Oh, well, that's a, that's a discovery, isn't it, you know? So, um, so then they spent about a year looking at the filmmakers, they're really interested in this, you know? This guy, by the way, he could predict, him and his team could predict whether the couple were going to break up and could predict how long it would take. Yeah. Well, something the quite couple. similar happened earlier on when we were playing the scales. We were all one or two sort of random now and then it all sort of seemed to fall in place, you know, yeah, right. sort of playing together. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you're, sorry, you're, you're going to get sidetracked here for a second. Couples breaking up. <laughs> at first it took them ages to do it, but after a while they got so good at doing it, they could sit in restaurants and after a few minutes they said, right, six months those two. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Read the book. It's a book, it's amazing. But anyway, get back to the playground. Um, so, so they film these kids, 
And then they tracked the film by, by playing it backwards. That they, uh, Where does this come from, this rhythm, right? Oh, it's coming from this little group of children. So there's this little group of children and they started it and they can you know when the children are talking and they kind of do this hopping one from one foot so they're all like this this little group of kids like this you know and after a while unconsciously it spread to all the other kids in the playground and then they tracked it down further in the end it started with this little girl and she was started to start like this and her friends started like this you know and they, they figured out they, they figured out the rhythm you know like this and then one of the teams, I know that tune, I know that tune. It turned out to be a pop tune, a popular pop tune that was in the charts at the time. Now, isn't that interesting? Well, you know, you me, it's interesting. <laughs> anyway. Um, but it says an awful lot about music, and it also says an awful lot about our role in music and our relation to other people while we're playing music. Don't you think, though? You know? So that's The Dance of Life by Edward T. Hall. Big wrong reading list and a viewing list here. Um, right, coming towards the end, just got five minutes, is that okay? Do you want to shut me up? Just, well, just shut me up. I can take all night if you want to. sure, it's rather warm in here. I don't want to bore people and I have to go to the pub as well, so... I'll, I'll be as quick as I can now, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, other people's motives for criticising you. Okay, you ready for this? I've been through all this. First one, this is with unpleasant stuff. Envy. Envy. Sometimes when people aren't musicians, they're envious of you. Sometimes if you play best or they think they play best than you do, they're envious of you. You know? Insecurity. People criticise you or are nasty about you when they have a go at you. They're insecure. You know? Just, just try and be kind with people and just try and understand the times when you felt insecure or envious of other people. You know, be kind to people. Because by being kind to people, you're not going into that negative thing anymore. You're keeping those nice hormones going again. You're not going into that thing. Oh, what did I always say this? You know, my shoulders go up and I've got to play. <laughs> you're not doing that. You know? So the way that you behave when you're with people is going to affect the way that you perform and the way that you play as well. It's kind of gamesmanship. You know, have a backstage persona before you perform. Have a backstage persona. Calm, speaking, smiling, smile a lot, chat with people. Be, be, have that type of an attitude. You're setting up a good, a good atmosphere for yourself. Negativity, deal with it and recognise where it's coming from. It's coming from insecurity, feelings of inadequacy. People have all sorts of problems. Don't judge them. You know, you don't know what they've been through. You know, it's it's, 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 a, it's a tough one. You know. Anyway, um, so. Um, other, other things about people in audiences. So, um, two stories. The Dean Marston story. Uh, stop me if you've heard it. Um, I was playing, and I, I played it. I just finished playing it. As I remember, I think it was a Ralph Towner piece, a solo Ralph Towner piece. I was really pleased. It was a really good performance. And uh, I thought it was doing okay. I think the audience, you know, can you read other people's words? I think the audience thought it was doing okay. And, uh, and I stopped for the interval, right? And this guy kind of goes... Um, he sort of leans over to me like this, you know, he catches my attention, just as well, and, and he goes, he goes. <laughs> so, and he hands me this little piece of paper, right, so I sort of, I, I, thought, I, uh, I opened it, and on the piece of paper was written, screwed up a bit, can you play Funny Old Wine Drinking Me by Dean Martin? <laughs> it's true. It happened to me first time. <laughs> How do you respond to something like that? <laughs> and did he think because I couldn't that I was any worse a musician? I just died. I can't tell what other people are thinking. You know, it's beyond me. Um, and then uh, the other one uh, I had. It was actually you mentioned before that you you're playing in the uh, the Priory. This happened to me at the Priory. I was sat there. I'm playing, right. And there's this guy, and he came, when I was setting up, he came about 40 minutes early, and he plonked himself, I'm here like this, you know, and he plonked himself just there on that chair. And, uh, and then, you know, set up, we go back, and then I was playing with another guitarist, and then we sit down, and we start, and as I'm playing, I'm kind of, I, I, I'm kind of, uh, um, I'm kind of like this, you know. Like that. And as I'm playing, 
this guy staring at my left hand, and I'm like, <laughs> And it, I get, it became a bit, it became a bit of a complex, really, because I kind of look away from him, you know. And then I finished the piece, you know. <laughs> He's still staring at me. He stared at my left hand for the whole concert, for the whole show. I just, I mean, I, I don't, I don't even like to think of it. What he thought, what I thought was he was getting out of it. I felt like sort of leaning over and reminding him that he did in fact have a right hand as well. But maybe that would have been asking too much. So audiences and how to deal with them, you know, it's, it's a thorny subject. Uh, anyway, um, so um, how to practice. So we've really covered this, so I'll just, just briefly reiterate, so it's sort of, so, um, you, how to use a metronome, we talked about that. Identifying warning signs, stress and tension, alarm bells, red lights flashing, dials going into the red, steam coming out of pipes, stress. Isolate, isolating problem spots, I'm sure you've heard this before. Learning, now, okay, learning to slow the tempo down to regain control. Right, this is an emergency strategy, right? This is called the I meant that rubato um, section in your piece, you know, because what can happen? The worst thing you can do is that if you if you if this the piece, if you start if the piece starts running away from you, it's a bit like being a learner driver. You're getting into a bend and you're going too fast and you're keeping your foot, you know, on the accelerator, you know, and you're going to crash. The thing to do is is to learn to take your foot off the accelerator, right? You won't be able to do that unless you practice to do it. So practicing deliberately saying, okay, I'm going to slow down now in this piece. I'm going to slow down and making yourself slow down and then find the tempo and then speed up. Do that as a master of policy. You know? Because then what you can do is when, you can, when you're performing, then you can kind of slow down. If you find yourself losing or you're having a memory lapse, that's time for a formato memory lapse. <laughs> 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 You can gather yourself, get in with your tempo, and then you'll carry through with it. You know, you'll land the plane. So, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, I suppose you want to learn so the dynamics, articulation. Yeah, for dynamics and articulation, I'm a huge fan of the Leo Brower, the 20 Leo Brower essays. I just think, I think everybody should play those essays. I think they're massive. I think that I think that they um, they come in at such an easy level. A lot of them are very very easy pieces. To, well, relatively easy pieces, but some of them are hideous, you know, mm -hmm. to play in their own way. Some of them are just out, they're all marvelous for, and every one is teaching you something, and it's teaching you things about articulation and slowing down and speeding up and dynamic control. Very loud, very soft. All these things are so so important, and you don't get them playing sore, or you just don't get them. You know, you you can put it in once you can do it. But Brown was brilliant because he really sort of, he, he focuses people's attention really on real weak points for guitarists in those studies. So I'm a huge fan. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying about Brower. Um, but I'm going to ask a devil's advocate question. Yeah. What if you don't love them? <laughs> Based upon what you said before. Ah. This is kind of going to apply to what a teacher yeah. giving yeah. you a piece yeah. that you don't love. To. Yeah. This will totally improve your writing yeah, arpeggio yeah, technique. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The flipping. My first reaction was learn to love them. <laughs> yeah. You do. You don't love them. No. No. But my, my, okay. That's fine. Don't don't play them. Really and truly, absolutely don't play them. You don't feel under any obligation to play anything. You know. But try and find something that you do love that's got those qualities. And even if, even if you, you know, even if you, you're determined, for example, just to play 19th century music, you know, I want to play 19th century music, try and bring those elements into 19th century music. Because you can bet your bottom dollar, you know, if you listen to Beethoven or Giuliani or somebody play, if you'd actually listen to them play, I bet that music would be much, much more, I know it would be, it would, because they improvise, we know this, but it would be much, much more alive. If there would be much, much more articulation than there's in the score. There'd be much, much more, more variation in tempo, the whole thing. So choose whatever you love and then reinvent it in your own imagination when you're playing this as well. But 
excuse me, try and bring those elements into the music that you actually love. But having said that, honestly, if you get to play those brow pieces and you get you get competence of playing with them, you kind of most of my students in the end, a lot of them start out hating them and a lot of them end up absolutely loving them. They're great, you know, but that's okay, that's my opinion, you know. But, um, okay, so uh, that's uh, so now um, I, I talked about this. Um, I, th I think of this um, four stages of um, practicing. So the first thing is the learning stage, right? So go through this process in your mind. What am I doing? Be clear. Am I learning? Am I practicing? Am I rehearsing? Or am I performing? Well, the performing bit is pretty damned obvious, right? But the other three arms, it's very, very easy to confuse learning with practicing, right? So what happens is if you don't do the learning stage first, you end up practicing mistakes, right? That's really, really bad, okay? So learn. The learning bit is when you've got your metronome, semi quavers at 40. That's learning, okay? The practicing bit is when you've learned and you can play it successfully at any speed. So if you can only play the whole piece, a quavers at 40 beats per minute, but you've got it dead nice and there's no f signs of tension, then it starts, uh, it's time to start practicing, right? Then you start increasing the tempo, then if you start feeling tension, then you take those little bits out of the piece, you slow it down, you get those up to the tempo, you bring it back up, then you take it from there and then you go forward with the piece. That's practicing. Okay? Rehearsing. Rehearsing is different from practicing. With practicing, you play a piece over and over again. With practicing, you might say, well, I'm going to practice that, that, uh, do that diminuendo. Um, I'll go a little bit quieter, I'll go a bit louder. When you rehearse, you're performing as if you are, you're, you're, you're playing as if you're performing. Right? So this is where my cameras come in with students, particularly students who are preparing for exams. I record people and I film people, right? When they're preparing, usually when they're preparing for exams, you know? And, um, and I play a bat to them. The camera puts tension on. One second you press that bus, you know? Recorder. Um, that's rehearsing because there's no second chances. If you make a mistake, you carry on because when you perform, you carry on. If you have a memory lapse, you pick up, you know? So rehearsing is actually performing without anybody there. That's the last stage. Now, if your rehearsing's going wrong, you need to go back two stages or one stage and then rehearse again. And then, of course, performing, which is what we've been talking about all night. Okay, very, very briefly now. How to begin. So the exercise that we did earlier, I use that all the time. I centre myself, I become aware of my breath, I become aware of my body. And then crucially, I start singing the piece in my imagination. Right? Don't count yourself in. If you touch the piece that should have gone, oh, one, two, three, four, we'll come on, one, two, three, four, we're off. Like this, like you know, like, like I'm looking on a horse. Don't do it. Do this. Then start and have the pieces, have your piece in your imagination. You're coming at exactly the right speed. You're coming dead consistently, the same that you were rehearsing at. You won't speed up. And that's about focus and awareness in what you're doing. Okay. Um, so. Uh, that's how to begin. That's how I begin, at least. I mean, I'm sure you talk to other musicians there, maybe they've got different techniques that worked for you great. I'm not being dogmatic about this. If you get in a crisis, memory loss in the singing, speeding up in the singing, clumsy or shaking hands, anyone? No one's going to own up. Piece of blocks. Piece of blocks. The amount of students that I've had go to the doctor, if you obviously go to a doctor, you know. It's around about, um, I think it's, it, uh, there's been some research done in the States, I think it's around about 30, 40% 30, of orchestral players use piece of blockers, you know. That says an awful lot about just how toxic an environment an orchestra is, mm -hmm. actually. There's loads and loads of stress with orchestral players. I don't know whether anyone watched that thing on the Berlin film. Those, those players, they earned their money, they went through hell, you know, absolutely. 
you know. But lots of them use visa blockers now. Um, okay, you know, so I don't take drugs in my body as a temple. You know, if you've got problems with shaking hands, the reason is is because the adrenaline. We're going back to hormones again. Okay, the adrenaline is coursing through your body, and that is a physiological response that some people have to adrenaline. You can't help it. The visa blockers prevent the effect of the shaking. You know, so visa blockers will work for you. The thing is as well, what you can do with them, and what I recommend, I've had students do this, what I recommend, is that they, they, they take the dose of beta blocker, then the next time they perform or they do an exam, they reduce the dose by half, and then another half, and then they just take like a quarter of a beta blocker, which basically is having no effect on them. And then they learn to become independent of it and they learn how to relax and then conquer those things through exposure and then through gradually reducing it. So if you, for some people, it's an awful shame. I've seen it happen time and time again where people get the shakes or people become too clumsy to play. Then visa blockers definitely are a good route. It's, do it under medical advice, use it wisely, but it, I've seen it really, really help people. Who, who have problems with it. So if you want to talk to me about it in the pub later, then we talk about it as well, because it's a big conversation. There's lots of big conversations tonight. Mm. So, so that's it. If you want to read a more sort of extensive thing, then go back to the notes. I think I sent, sent some to Yvonne, didn't I? If anyone's not got those, by all means, have another read of them. Yeah. I can put them on the website. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, I've just tonight, tonight uh, deliberately, I've just tried to be more personal about this and try and communicate something about my own experience and the way I've solved problems in my own playing. That twice I've had problems performing. First time just after I left college, partly because I was badly taught, right? Second time just in, re in recent years, uh, actually within the last few years, and that's because I'm suffering from a um, uh, hearing disability. And I uh, had incredible problem playing with people in, in ensembles. And I had incredible problem uh, adjusting to hearing aids and getting the right hearing aids. And it gave me incredible problems, incredible problems performing. Actually, I actually thought of giving up performing because of, because of the problems with hearing. Um, fortunately, now I've got these wonderful hearing aids and a good audiologist, and you've got no idea the difference it's made. And I feel like, I feel like I've got a new lease of life again. Uh, which is fantastic. Okay, so that's it, everybody. So thanks for being so patient. I hope this has been useful to you. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. If you have questions, Paul agreed nicely to come to the pub with us. Although You're not in the pub or in the pub or here? If you have urgent questions, of course, okay. you can ask questions. Urgent <laughs> questions? Any urgent, really? No. He keeps getting up with it. <laughs> 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 it's thirsty work. <laughs> I just thought it would be more relaxed. He would be feeling more comfortable yeah. and more like, more uh, home. That sounds very good. <laughs> no, no questions. Is well, well, anybody a bit yeah. sorry? Uh, no, no, no. Is anybody a big fan of bark at all for practicing? No. You know, transposed. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've, I've had a look and, uh, you know, I, I'm at no standard, I have to say. But uh, I've tried to pick through. I mean, there's some nice melodies, you know, Jesus, man of, Jesus, joy of man's desiring. And there's that partita that I tried. Da -da 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 -da. And I got about. 15 bars into that and thought this is too hard work uh, but I thought there, were, there might have been some merit, I suppose it's like English and Shakespeare some people can't get on with Shakespeare although there must be some merit in, you know, the English of, of Shakespeare and uh, I don't know what, what do others feel on um, the, there's some there's some Bach violin duets which I remember learning when I first when I first went to uh, college. There are two violins and they're quite oh, the, quite the, accessible. Is that the double violin concerto? No, 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 the concerto. Oh, no, they oh. just they're just kind of like beginners piece. Yeah, yeah. And there's been some transcriptions from the Anna Madden's first wife, Alan, oh. second wife, Alan Magdalena. Mag Mag oh, notebooks. Oh, oh. Some of those have been transcribed for guitars, yeah. and they're very very simple little beginners.
first piece. Oh, so you can, the, you, there are nice little simple transcriptions of Bach pieces, yeah. or pieces which have been adapted from Bach for guitar. Yeah. There's some nice beginner Bach pieces on the Associated Board repertoire as well, around about grade three. Uh -huh. um, again, they're pretty accessible round about that grade. I'm not sure how uh, experienced you are. But they're, they're not absolute beginner's pieces, but round yeah. about grade two, grade three, there's some nice nice pieces, ball yeah. pieces, that are yeah. accessible, yeah. you know. Something with an, a nice melody in it. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's, yeah. That's it, yeah, yeah, Bach's yeah. good for melodies, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, personally, I, I love Bach smallish doses, not for too long. Mm. I, get, I get... It's a, heavy, isn't it? It's... Uh, Oh. A lot of the textures to seem to run room. Yeah, it's personal, isn't it? So I love it in small doses, but if it goes on too long, yeah. um, I, I kind of tire. But sometimes it knocks me out. You know? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not on my own. Okay, is that anybody well, else? I was, I was just going to ask you. I was struck when you were talking about the singer songwriters and you were saying, Oh right. As a singer songwriter, you have that ability to sort of affect. Yes. A, a connection. Yes. Of putting something Emotional. Uh, I was thinking about, because a lot of people hate this, what do you think about when players kind of move a lot or make faces? Is that the same <laughs> thing? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, this has got to be a personal opinion, hasn't it? Um, I de personally, I find it off-putting when people do that in instrumental music. Um, uh, so in my own playing, I, uh, it's something I, I try not to do, uh, and as I've, as I've gone on, I think I do less and less. Um, I, d I do I do find that I, I think movement with the with the, move, with the music I think can be nice. Sometimes when I'm when when I'm sort of really getting into playing, I don't know whether I can just do it cold really, but sometimes. <laughs> If something's quite rhythmic like that, I find myself doing that, you know. Um, that's okay, I don't mind watching people, but like you say, I mean, I'm the same, you know. If, I, if I'm kind of going, with all this, you know. I honestly think it's a discourtesy to the audience. Yeah. You're, 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 you're there to watch them, they're supposed to be performing it. If they're so self involved, they should learn to control themselves because oh, it's, it's just distracting. Oh, I think it should put the attention more to the music rather than the yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yes. and I do, th I do think. Yeah. I went to a piano concert once and they just stop it away, and, and it's just like, no, yeah. learn to not do that because it's yeah. just detracting from the whole performance and the whole thing. It's just. You know. I, I don't like this thing when, you know, when they kind of throw their head back and ecstatic, you know. I, I always think there's, there's, there's an element of, you know, the uh, the kingdom, narcissism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is that, is that too harsh? It's a kind of, well, oh, this person having this moment. Uh, it's, that maybe that's just my northern temperament. <laughs> Don't like to see <laughs> people showing off like that too much. It's just, you know. I, I, mean, I, I pretty much agree, but I think that, like everything, I suppose, there's degrees, isn't there? And it's, yeah. Just a little bit of movement or a little bit of. It might not even be conscious, but you were talking about getting into that getting zone into that. Yeah. where you, you yeah. Know, the audience is but gone, and you, yeah. or maybe that's what it takes. Yeah, yeah. I, the thing is, you're going back to the Edward T. Hall book and people like relating to, you know, that connection between the audience, that rhythmic connection. I feel that if, if you are like that and it's genuinely coming from the music, I think that people intuitively know that that's going on. Yeah. And then, and, can, and that helps people kind of... But I think that if you're being, you know, I think it's about falsity and pretentiousness. I think if you're being false and pretentiousness, I think it, all of us have got this kind of pretentiousness sort of like um, detector. And I think that naturally we kind of go, uh oh, you know, <laughs> there's a bit of, there's a, there's a bit of, uh, you know, bullshit coming, coming out here, a bit of pretentiousness, you know, a bit of narcissism. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, it's a complex, you know, all these questions are complex, aren't they, you know, to answer. I mean, I really, I'm a, I'm a massive admirer of Keith Jarrett. So after, that's just made a total nonsense of everything I've just said, hasn't it, you know? 
Um, <laughs> I mean, he does it bad, you know. But you see, his excuse is that he can't actually do what he does unless he does do it. He's tried not to do it, really, you know, all the moaning and the gyrating. But when he does that, he kind of tries to do that, and he just can't stop doing it, which is he's obviously learned to, to you know. Um, but he's a special case because what he does is so phenomenal that I'm kind of glad, I'm prepared to, you know, <laughs> it's a bit like a cookie with a crack in it, you know, and you can still eat it. <laughs>